so excited today because one of my friends of, gosh, over 20 years, uh, I won't reveal how old we are, but it's just, it's a, it, yeah, a long, long, long time friend. And I've watched both of our lives, but especially yours, pivot over the years, and you go after your dreams, and you're damn good at what you do. And I feel like- And what's her name? Jen Pinkerton. Guys, just assume everybody knows Jen, <laughs> but yes. Jen Pinkerton, the psychotherapist? Yes, yeah, psychotherapist. To the stars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am so excited to be here. And having known you for so long, this is really fun, and I'm excited to do this. So. <laughs> I had a meltdown earlier. She's going to walk out and go, hey, you're really screwed up. We really need to talk. We need some one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> you know, if I even had a penny for how many people say that when they find out that this is what I do, so it is kind of comical. But, you know, I'll say there isn't a human being alive that doesn't have something. We all have something, you know. Everybody has something they're working through, challenges, trying to figure themselves out, trying to be the best version of themselves. I don't think we escape that. But, you know, I was listening to some um, uh, other shows that you had done last night, and you talk about the big T's versus mm -hmm. the little T's. Yes. Fascinated me. Explain mm -hmm. what that is. Sure. So trauma is one of the things I focus on, obviously, since I work with relationships and I work with how people interact with other people. And trauma can be described, at least in my definition that I use, as anything that overwhelms the body's ability to cope. So you experience an event, an, an experience, whether it's long-term, short-term, and it overwhelms or floods your body with a way that you don't know how to cope with that. And so that becomes embedded and stored in your body and in your memory. And that's trauma, but there's big T trauma and little t trauma. And a lot of people don't want to acknowledge trauma because they think it wasn't big T, which is you know, neglect, abuse, death, violence, things that are very big that we all would obviously know that's really traumatic to experience something like that. But we can't really minimize or compare trauma because little t trauma can be just as serious of an effect on the body and our ability to function. Little t trauma would be something more along the lines of, you know, I was in school and I was on the playground and nobody played with me. For some reason, I really didn't get to engage with people. So I've spent the rest of my adult life stuck in a child part, which remembers that trauma, remembers that memory of not feeling like I belonged. That was fascinating to me. And because so, we all do carry. Yes, everybody does. Ooh, it's repressed. And, and but. Exactly. I, I just don't think anyone escapes that. I think we, we all have some sort of traumatic situation or problem that we've experienced that hold us back in life from success. And that's what doing the work is. When people talk about doing emotional work, which is a big foundation platform for me that I talk about, is everybody needs to do some work. And that work is self-exploration. It's self-awareness. It's reflection. It's understanding what are our automatic response systems that do not serve us anymore. They might have done so at one time, so pat ourselves on the back. It's so great that we figured out how to cope, how to survive. But then eventually we get out of that mode and it's not helpful to us anymore. So do you help instill the coping skills or it's, it's help not you discover your own? coping skills. It's being able to understand these were the ones you had, and that's great you had them, but they don't really work anymore. So let's learn something new. Let's learn how to downregulate our nervous system. Let's learn how to be present in the moment how to be emotionally regulated, so that when we're triggered by these prior experiences that our body remembers so vividly, that we don't go there immediately. We're not immediately taken back to that place of like that example I gave of that person on the playground. They don't immediately feel like they don't belong when they walk in a room. Right. That they can regulate themselves. They have that strong, beautiful inner voice in their head that's positive, that tells them things that are motivating about who they are and who they want to be. And they don't have to sit in that place of feeling as though they don't belong. They can walk in, they can engage with other people, they can interact, and they can realize, I'm the adult that's thriving now, not the child that's still hurting. So it's processing. I know that it, it builds. So if you don't address these things, mm -hmm. so, you know, somebody might say, gosh, why are you so sensitive? Mm -hmm. And it's things like that that have been festering. Mm -hmm. And, and sure. it might be, and you look at it and say, it was something minute. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I blew it up. Right. And why did I do those things? Well, and that's why I just don't ever minimize. You can't compare it. I mean, you could have somebody that grew up in a household with a lot of violence and a lot of abuse or neglect or addiction. And you can have someone else that grew up in a beautiful household with parents that were very present and emotionally attuned, but maybe they still didn't feel like they, they were 
you know, happy. Maybe something was off. Maybe they competed with a sibling. Maybe they got primary love lessons from their parents that made them feel like they were only worthy of love when they were performing. Even those parents never meant to do that. They were just simply celebrating success. There's things that happen in the way we look at life through our lens. And so the work to do is as we're adult, if we realize we're stuck, we're not thriving, we're not functioning in relationships in a healthy way, we're not being the version of us we want to be, and we always have repeated patterns and behaviors, then we probably need to explore the why of those repeated patterns and behaviors. And once we figure out the why, that's when we can transform. So where do you start? I mean, they say admitting is the first step of the Mm -hmm. 12-step program. True. But (laughs) but where does one start if they want to say, you know, I feel like I have these shortcomings. I mean, is it retreats on the weekend? Is it books that you read? Is it just journaling? I think that there's so many options. You know, you can work with a psychotherapist or a coach. I do both the, you know, work with both people in both different ways. There's people who can learn so much from self-help, from podcasts, from going to retreats, from doing things that focus. But I think the main idea is to recognize maybe I'm the common denominator. If th- if I'm not achieving what I want to in life, if I feel in every single relationship, there might be something here for me to look at because it can't always be everyone else. Right. right. And I think we have to have accountability for how we show up. And I'm really big on talking about that, showing up. We show up a certain way. We decide this is who we are. And so oftentimes we'll say, well, that's just, that's just who I am. Okay, but wait a minute. But why are you that way? What made you that way? What did you experience that caused you to be that way? And is that really who you want to be? Do we want to give that much credit to our six-year-old version of ourselves, Or do we want to have grace for the six-year-old, be glad that that six-year-old figured out how to survive and cope, but instead be a nice, healthy, wonderful 40-year-old that feels so differently about everything? And all that power is within us. So I'm really big on talking about taking your power back and being the, you know, the person that we're supposed to be. How do you get to a point, you said you coaches Mm -hmm. and psychotherapists Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or whatever level, I mean, I'm not really sure what, you know, the different Mm -hmm. levels that there are. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll happy to explain that. So psychotherapists are usually people that have gone to get their master's program in either marriage and family therapy or counseling or something in that way. They become a licensed by the state that they're in. They do all their training, all their education, all their supervision, and they get to a place where they're able to independently provide therapy, counseling to people. There's also coaching and coaching is very different. Coaching is not regulated, um, you know, by the state in that way. It's not a licensable thing. And coaching can certainly be very effective too, but coaching doesn't necessarily necessarily address trauma. Coaching's more uh, current day life skills, current day coping, current day present time, um, which is still very valuable and wonderful. They're just different ways. You can certainly work on relationships in that too, but you probably wouldn't do the deep dive on the that inner child type of situation. Um, I think learning from books, learning from podcasts, learning from immersion of some kind, deciding, you know what, I want to learn everything I can about this thing because I've realized this reminds me of me, this, this what I'm seeing. Sometimes people follow, you know, like I'll have Instagram on my Instagram. I do post all the time weekly and it might be about your attachment style and someone's never explored their attachment style. They learn about that in a reel. So then they want to get a book and they want to read about it and they want to learn more. And then they start recognizing, you know what, wait a minute, I can actually look at life a little differently. So I think anything Give else. us an example of an attachment style. Sure. So attachment style is basically kind of what we're hardwired to do in a relationship. It comes from our primary love lessons of our attachment growing up. So There's four main types, um, and people can be a combination, and and people can also migrate at different phases in their life. The holy grail is to be secure. We all want to be securely attached. Securely attached people um, feel very sure about who they are. They have very healthy boundaries. They don't accept less than they deserve. And a lot more people are attached than we, securely attached than we think. There's also people who are anxiously attached. And anxiously attached kind of sounds like what it is, where you have that maybe desperate need of feeling concerned about abandonment. You might be um, really difficult in relationships because you don't feel like you're ever getting what you need. You don't feel like you're prioritized. You don't feel like you're getting the reassurance. And that comes from those inner wounds that, that are now being projected in that relationship, if that makes sense. And then usually those things overlap other things like trauma bond. For sure. Yes, completely, because they make you more susceptible right. to to accepting relationships that might not be healthy. And then avoidant is kind of the opposite of the side of anxious. And avoidant is someone who actually craves that same, that has the same craving as the anxiously attached person for security, for love, for connection, but they're very uncomfortable with it. So they're going to be distant. They're going to step away. They're going to run from commitment because that feels very uncomfortable and, and basically overwhelming. 
even though they want it to in their core. And then there's disorganized, which is a combination of both. So that means at times you're anxiously attached and at times that you're, you're more avoidant. And it doesn't mean that you're stuck with whatever that attachment style is. And it doesn't mean that any of them are wrong. I, I'm very careful about pathologizing things. I never like to exp- to present something in a negative way because we all have these things that would be saying something about myself too. You know, I would love to say I'm always securely attached and I think I've worked very hard to be that way, but there were times in my life where I certainly wasn't. And so being able to explore that and do that self-reflection about how do I function in a relationship and also what am I attracted to and what do I attract? A key term is self-reflection because so many of the things that you're saying now, I feel like I didn't really reach a point in my life until I was ready to do my personal work and I still have tons to do, but I really didn't get to a place until I was probably 36 years old where I could really sit in my own uncomfortable feeling of maybe, maybe it's sad, maybe it is grief, maybe it's longing, maybe it's, you know, conjuring up things from the past that I have repressed and actually allowing myself to feel the full scope of what those emotions are, whether it is sad or, you know, and maybe, maybe it's laying down on the floor and crying until there aren't any tears left. But I feel like a lot of people that I've come in contact with are like, oh, don't cry. It's going to be okay. Well, for me saying, don't cry, don't, don't feel that, don't express that is kind of like, well, let's just sweep that under the rug because it's actually one of the worst things right. that, that anybody can say. It's, it's, it's one of my pet peeves in parenting that I really, really talk about often is we never want to tell someone don't cry. Why would we want to teach a child, much less be an adult and teach ourselves that it's okay to repress our feelings? We want to feel our feelings because we actually have to feel our feelings to heal from them. If we never acknowledge I'm hurting, if we never hold space for ourselves to be able to cry, to feel, to, to go through through that process instead of just saying it's okay we're not gonna think about it it doesn't matter but it does matter it hurts you so take a moment to talk about that with yourself take a moment to say yeah that was really painful and you know when I was hurting that brought up feelings about this and when I think about this I think about this memory when this happened and you go down this path with yourself but you're telling your body and your nervous system that this is safe We can talk about feelings. We don't have to be scared. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen. We can be present in the moment and feel like we're fine, you know? And so that's a big thing to be able to have the ability to feel what you feel. And to hear that you're able to do that and you got to a place in your life. I mean, what I'm hearing you say is now you're comfortable to do that. And that's an amazing thing. Right. And kind of even going further, understanding um, just as reference, you know, you think about your parents, you think about how I was raised and where did I learn whatever skills or not skills I haven't Mm -hmm. developed at this point. And for me personally, you know, I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast. You know, I had a dysfunction in my upbringing and there were drugs involved in addiction and my mom was present, but she had an abusive boyfriend. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I ejected myself from that situation and was raised mostly by my grandparents. Mm -hmm. My mom was involved, Mm -hmm. but there's a lot in all of that as you grow up and you're like, no, I was taken care of, but not by necessarily with all of the enthusiasm that I wanted from my parents. And I have talked to Christy about this before, and we actually watched it together, but there's that movie, August Osage County. Mm -hmm. And when I watched that movie, I watched this dynamic between Meryl Streep and Julia Roberts as they portray these characters in this film. And that movie for me taught me so much in that there's forgiveness for what maybe who came before you didn't know what they were passing down. Like, Mm -hmm. I have forgiven my parents for what they didn't give me because it wasn't ever their fault. Well, you touch on something that's really important, and that's generational trauma. Most parents do the very best they can with what they have. And, you know, we also look at life to say that we're not what we experienced, we're what we actually become. So we have a choice. We have a choice to say, you know what, I don't have to blame my parents. I don't have to, you know, hate my parents. I can say they did the very best that they could. And in your case, you're saying you had a mother that was present and, and, and loved you, but and was it a situation that, that, that wasn't healthy. Is my absolute and best friend today. Exactly. Absolute and so it's not friend. about, I think so many people are very reluctant to go back and explore that because there's this fear of, oh, I don't want to have ill will towards a mother or a parent or, or a grandparent or anyone. And it's not about that. It's about actually just processing the feelings and recognizing that that did affect you understanding how it did affect you, and then how can I pivot? How can I actually say that I'm going to own it, I'm going to feel it, and I'm going to feel safe with it? 
because I'm really a big believer on our nervous system. And if we are offline, if we are constantly in fight or flight or fawn right. or freeze, and we're not able to ever relax and be at peace, you know, we're doing ourselves such a huge disservice and, and enjoying life, really. Well, and even to that point also, with Christy, I feel like her health complications, mm-hmm. you know, it was, uh, what, a little over 16 months ago, I guess. Uh, we were driving back from LA Mm -hmm. and she, you know, has had these strokes, health ailments Mm -hmm. and not any conclusive real, Mm -hmm. no clots, Yeah, nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, there has, there's something's missing. And I Mm -hmm. found a podcast about the relationship of stress to stroke Mm -hmm. and really what stress will do to Mm -hmm. the complete nervous system of a human being and gut health and, you know, functional medicine and the Dutch test. And I said, we have to dive deeper. We have to look at your cortisol levels. We have to look about how your body has processed this trauma. We have to kind of dissect you from the inside out and figure out maybe it's not anything that's going to be calculated by your vascular neurologist Mm -hmm. because it's so much deeper than that and so much more connected. And I feel like what you're saying is absolutely true. It is. I mean, and and what you're describing, have you ever read the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Vessel van der Kolk? I mean, it talks about our body holds on to everything and it causes illness. And when our nervous system... I downloaded it the minute I heard you talking about it. it. It's wonderful because that's what it is. It's truly... It's kind of the modern codependent no more. There's always that book every decade. That's right. It is. And and it shows what a lot of people in modern medicine, you can have beautiful doctors that are very smart, very intelligent, but they're not taught that in med school in that way. I think now the world is changing and shifting and there's so much more of of an ownership to acknowledge that... If we are in an unhealthy environment for our for our emotions, our body is going to suffer. And our body cannot exist in fight or flight or freeze or fawn, the four trauma responses, forever. At some point you will break. It's just impossible. You know, our bodies aren't designed for that. We're so unbelievably resilient. And the neuroplasticity of our brains to be able to keep functioning and keep going and moving on, it's great. But eventually it won't work anymore. And that's when you have to figure out, okay, How can I address this? And addressing it, I think functional medicine is so wonderful because it looks at things very differently. And it looks at the impact of how our body is storing things. And when we start addressing our nervous system and we understand how to deal with breath work, we understand how to ground ourselves, we understand how to feel so differently about how we take care of ourselves, you know, then we can really change how we feel inside and out. I didn't really quite internalize how powerful all of that was until it was probably about right at a year ago. Mm -hmm. I had to have her take me to the urgent care because I thought I was having a heart attack and it was truly a panic attack. But for me, I had no outward signs. Like yeah. I didn't feel anxious. My heart wasn't racing. There was nothing about how I felt that eluded to me I was anxious, but my whole body was in a complete panic mode mm-hmm. that, I mean, they're there, they're running the EKG. I'm like, I have to go to the emergency room. I'm not okay. And it's so scary. It it's is so scary. Feeling. But to really like say out loud, no, if you are somebody that's experienced, you could be having these body manifestations <laughs> truly from stress or right. like you said, unprocessed trauma. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so that's when it goes back to the original concept. We have to feel to heal. We have to go back. We have to go backwards and understand the origin point of when we began to have to cope, when we began to have to look at life differently, when we began to to get stuck, basically. Now, I feel like I've never heard the word narcissism, gaslighting, uh, bread crumb, bread, bread crumbing, bread crumbing. Mm-hmm. All these things, it seems like they've erupted in about the past 36 months. Well, I think that that is due to Maybe the not advent in your of industry, social media. But- and, you know, especially TikTok and things like that, when, when there's so many videos and there's so much information that's readily available in a short little burst of dopamine hits. Right. And younger generations love the dopamine hit. It becomes instant access. They're addicted to it. They look at it. It feels good. They learn more and more and more. And while some of it can be educational, some of it is harmful because it's out of context. You know, are, is there gaslighting? Of course. Are there people that are on the narcissistic spectrum that can be very hurtful and, and covert and, and extremely unhealthy? Yes. Are people also just assholes? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so it doesn't mean that every asshole is a narcissist. It, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that. And so I think that it does a disservice in that because then you have especially a younger generation that's raised to, to use buzzwords, maybe right. per se, exactly. in completely the wrong way. And maybe, you know, tell somebody this is, you're the problem, you're this. But my first question would be, well, why are you attracted to that? What is it in you that you haven't healed that you're attracted to that? We all do that. 
There's not one person that's in a relationship where they accept less than they deserve that they don't have to do work to. Is the person an asshole? Yes, absolutely. But you accepted it. And so you have to work on that. I've done that. I've been in relationships where I've accepted less than I deserve. And so you have to do that inventory of yourself to recognize I need to heal from that. So that then the next time I can go, no, that's not for me. I could set a boundary and recognize you it. You recognize Because it. we don't recognize it earlier. I Most ordered that on a menu before and it kept me up all night. <laughs> there you go. Right. I mean, you know, and it's like we also do what we know. I mean, we're creatures of habit. That's just human nature. That That's neural pathways in the brain. We've done this before. It feels familiar. Let's do it again. Of the quarter of a century I've known, you've always been a true uh, purveyor of people. You love people you like watching them tick i can remember I'm very observant at dinner tables with you and <laughs> dissecting this is long before yes, you took true. this path I, I was a writer before i got mm -hmm. into this this part of, of my job and i still write and you know I, I have a book that's coming out next year i'm working on and i'm almost done with my phd which is all writing i mean that this is I, I married my passions basically the introspection and the interest in understanding people I've always been in love with the way people show up, human behavior, right. basically. And so being able to kind of couple all that together in a way for my career has been really wonderful for me. You know, because you can look at a family and, you know, I can remember growing up, I was a product of divorce. My parents had a hellacious divorce that uh, I was nine years old and my mother didn't tell anybody she was getting divorced. Mm -hmm. And she and her sisters all fall together mm. and didn't wow. tell so I was, it was Christmas morning. They came to deliver the papers. My dad didn't know. No one knew. And I was at the neighbor's house going over our loot. Mm -hmm. You know, right. where we got, and my mother drove up and said, get in the car. We're going to take a trip. Pajamas and no shoes on. I didn't ever went back to my house again. Wow. And people were like, oh, that's kind of crazy. And as you get older, you think, is that trauma? Mm -hmm. Like you, you well, wonder, absolutely, it is. absolutely. But if you, I grew up in a small town. We didn't have therapists mm -hmm. and things. You know? Well, and even back then, though, generationally, I mean, it is only now. It's only really since the pandemic, right, that people view mental health and the need to get help without having that stigma it attached. Used to in the way be, it was. do I feel right? And say it was, it was kind of a taboo. That's right. Right, something's wrong with you. When in fact, if that's what we're going to say, then something's wrong with everybody. Right. I mean, if that, that's really where we're going to go. Because there's not one human alive that isn't affected by something in their life. You know? You know, I watched um, an accident happen right in front of me. Didn't know these people. And the woman was killed. And I tried to forewarn this woman to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And she was run over by a horse going oh. full speed. How horrible. So somebody suggested to me EMDR. EMDR, the gold standard well, for trauma treatment. It was really hard mm -hmm. 10 years ago to find anybody that yeah. did it in Houston. And I found one lady, and she's kind of a young girl, someone close by the gallery, and she was like, okay, what is a, a relaxing place for you? Well, a hammock. Mm -hmm. What do you see that mm -hmm. makes you know, swans? Now, Give me a smell that makes you... Your safe place. Chocolate chip cookies. I must have gained 10 pounds just Because <laughs> then you can't get that smell out of your mind. And But I thought... And, and it was like a stick. Now I, it's advanced where you can yeah. use a light bar. Okay. But they have different ways. It's basically tapping into, you know, the right brain and the left brain, um, the hemispheres. And so you can tap but into all the different memories. things that you're capable mm -hmm. of doing. It's yeah. not just... Laying on the couch no, saying, no. I'm screwed up. No. If I were on like a dating site or something and somebody said, oh, actively in therapy, I would I would see that as a badge of a, like, oh. Okay, that, that is so funny you say this because I'm going to segue, but it's it's pretty entertaining. I cannot count how many times people say, can you just please set me up with someone? Because you know if they're healthy or not. Like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I can't do that. There's this thing called confidentiality. It doesn't work that way. But I, I have a peer in New York who started a dating site adjunct to her therapy practice. And I'm like, you know what? I might need to explore how I can ethically do that you in a different way. Because the there is something there. Because it's true. I mean, wouldn't everybody like to be able to screen their partners to Absolutely. see if they're emotionally healthy? Right. And emotionally healthy to me means I'm a work in progress, but I acknowledge that I have work to do. And I'm actively continuing to grow and be self-reflective and self-aware. And I want to be better for not just myself, but for, be right. a better person to you. Right. And, and be a better parent, a better daughter, a better friend, a better lover, a better everything. You know? How you have the two most gorgeous, poised 
young ladies. Thank you. And what, how amazing it has been for them growing up with you as their mom. Because I, I, I worship them. I truly do. But not only are they beautiful, but they have the most beautiful manners. But they're so present when you talk to them. Even as young children, mm-hmm. they were present when you You spoke know, they're to very them. loved. They grew up very loved. Um, their father loves them very much. I love them very much. They grew up very loved. And they're very smart little cookies, you know. And I wanted to work very hard as a parent to be emotionally attuned to them. I wanted to always validate those big feelings. I wanted to be certain that I could do everything as right as I could. But I can also sit here and say, I am sure they have a lot of things when they reflect back that didn't feel good to them. As beautiful and wonderful and and as emotionally healthy as you can look at them and see, they still have things too. And I just think it's always so important to say that because if we set this standard that because somebody looks all this way, they don't have anything to deal with, then then that's, you know, that's not realistic. But I do think that they're very aware. They're very self-aware. They're very able to say, you know what, that isn't, that isn't healthy for me. That doesn't work for me. And they know how to set boundaries. Good. And I feel like if, if, if we're going to look at a parenting lens, you know, if we're able to teach our children how to set boundaries – We're able to teach them that you know what you deserve and you know what your power is and don't accept less. We're able to validate big feelings. And when they're hurting, instead of telling them like you were talking about quit crying, you're able to say, I bet that was really painful for you. Let's talk about it. Right. And then give them that feeling of safety with that. And then we're able to be curious. We're curious about who they are. We want to allow them all this room to grow and and figure out their own identity, not the one we have decided they should have, you know and give them space to feel their feelings, then we're, we're setting them up in the right way. You know, those are way more important than the things that we used to think were important. I remember growing up thinking, you know, being raised in an environment, you know, your grades are all that matter. This is all that matters. You've right. got to do here. You've got to do this, everything. And my mother did the very best she could with what she had. But, but it still affects all children because you go through pain. I lost my father when I was 12 years old. I had a lot of grief and a lot of trauma from that. And my mother did the very best she could with helping me heal from that. But of course it affected me. You know, there's an ACEs score, basically, which is basically ranks traumatic experiences for therapists and clinicians to use to understand how much trauma somebody might have. And that's just big T trauma. That's not little T trauma. Right. But on an ACEs score, you have divorce, you have death, you have violence, you have grief, you have addiction, you have mental health problems in your family. You're going to score pretty high. But so many people, you know, don't even acknowledge that. You know, it's fine. It was fine. I grew up fine. You know, one of my least favorite words in the world is fine for that reason. You know, it seems like we progress. I guess it was maybe the early 90s mm-hmm. when uh, medication came mm-hmm. out. Yes. To, you know, this is going to be the cure-all. Mm-hmm. And you take a pill and, um, you know, I was pretty young, but I can remember uh, our a neighbor that we had, an elderly man, had cancer. And he took chain mm-hmm. to his locked onto his riding lawnmower and went off in his pool. And they said, oh, it's because he was taking this, you know, Mm -hmm. SSRI. Mm -hmm. I don't want to shame anybody. Sure, but he was taking something. And um, Mm -hmm. I just think to myself, and it was still kind of, you felt when people told the story, it was kind of taboo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I wonder why that he was so successful. Mm -hmm. You know, he was retired, but a successful business and, Mm -hmm. All these things. And then as we started progressing, they I felt like more catch words. And then mm-hmm. you started hearing, well, your problem is you're just codependent. You're mm-hmm. codependent. Mm-hmm. You need to get the book codependent no more because mm-hmm. you're codependent. Okay. And you just hear people throw, you know, now and the thing right. is narcissism. All right. Everybody wants to label someone. Yeah. And what do labels matter anyway? At the end of the day, if someone's a narcissist, they're not going to get help anyway. So it really doesn't matter if you call them out all day long. It's irrelevant. What really matters is what kind of boundaries you set to know I don't want to be in that type of relationship. So do you feel that narcissists know that they're these things? What goes through their mind? I mean, I know you studied it. that, That can you look at someone and say, okay, I think this is where your shortcomings are are Mm -hmm. falling down for you. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you need to build up the foundation on this side to support. Mm -hmm. But... If they look at you and say, well, I don't have a problem, is it really hard? It's a spectrum. And so there are people who can be on one end and have narcissistic traits. 
and a probably spectrum like a spectrum neurodivergent. Meaning, no, no, I mean as far as like if you're going to say it's from here to here. Over here is not so bad, and over here is really bad. Okay. So an axis. Maybe I should say that instead of a spectrum. Um, there are people that have narcissistic traits, and they certainly can be problematic in a relationship. But they might have a tiny bit of self uh, interest and self reflection to get some help if someone helped them to get there. They probably have to be motivated by some reason or person or thing. But most people. If you're going to use that word, they're falling on the other end of that axis, which means that they're covert, they're manipulative, and, and, and they're basically a function of their own trauma. You know, they turned inward to be their own, their own everything, so to speak, and it's going to be extremely unhealthy and it's not going to change. But after they've rolled this way so far in life, isn't it hard for somebody, let's say, over maybe 40, 50, 60? It's almost impossible. Right. Because most narcissists never seek help. Never. Because they would have to acknowledge there was something wrong with them. So it just, it, it, it almost never happens. I mean, I'm not going to say never. There have been a few instances. Dr. Phil said, uh, if you were in, in touch with one, run. He's like, because I, I don't treat them. Either. It's, it's very difficult to treat. And again, I would only say it's if someone has some traits and maybe they're younger and haven't had so much life experience to get stuck in that, that place um, of their behaviors and patterns. But it's very difficult, and I would hope that no one that I know or love would be in a relationship with someone um, that was truly a diagnosed narcissist. But again, there's also people that are just assholes. There's also people that just show up poorly. There's also people that are jerks. There's also people that are just selfish. It doesn't necessarily make you that a it narcissist. It feels good to them. It you know? raises some That's serotonin right. for them. And, to... and, you know, trauma can show up in that way, too. There can be somebody that has had a lot of trauma, and they've never done any work for it, and they've decided they never want to be hurt again. So they're going to hurt everybody first. There's people who feel so insecure that they've got to put you down to feel better. Classic bully. There's so many behavior patterns that we will lump in and go, ooh, is that narcissism? Probably not. But are they a jerk? Do you need to not be with them because they're not healed? Probably so. You know? But can those people get some help? Absolutely. So it's, it depends. You know? It's not an easy answer because I can't say that <laughs> most people that people think are narcissists are not, frankly. You know? It's a very deep um diagnosis and it's not one that's done casually um but they certainly do exist but i think there's oftentimes just a lot of people are, are assholes and, and you got to recognize it's not for me well and like you said don't want to do the work because when you think about it you think oh gosh i've been through x y and z i don't want to i mean how many times do you talk to people and they say oh i don't like to talk about myself or i don't want to mm -hmm. well you're only giving yourself a gift if you sit there and you do the work, if you sit there and you go through the bad stuff, if you let yourself feel the bad stuff so that you get over it to the place where you can thrive without having to relive all those experiences every time right. something else traumatic comes up. You're like, I already know how to deal with this. Yes. I've arrived. I can get through it. And I know that I'll still be breathing tomorrow morning and I'm going to be okay. And that's psychoeducation. I mean, and it doesn't have to mean you have to go see a therapist or go see a coach or go to retreat. You can listen to podcasts. You can read books. You know, I did a 52-week book challenge last year for the sole purpose of giving people some self-empowerment. You want to read about some topics? I can tell you these are some books that are great. And there's plenty in there on a variety of topics so that you can get your own help. I, I don't believe we should ever be dependent on anyone. And that's, you know, I hate to say that because I'm a psychotherapist. Would I love all the business in the world? Sure. But, but it's not about that. It's truly that we all need to have some way, some mechanism to be a better version of ourselves, to return to the person we're born to be. Before we were limited by trauma, before we were limited by all the societal impact and concerns, and before we developed these deeply rooted behaviors and patterns that are only just survival. Okay, so speaking of 52, I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times, the 52-part series mm -hmm. on TikTok, mm -hmm. Who the F Did I Marry? Yes, I've seen that. Okay. <laughs> I've seen that many times, many times. What does that say about her, though, that, in other words, how many different red flags did she see that she chose not to? But let's think about why somebody would ignore a red flag. Maybe because this feels familiar. If you grow up in a chaotic environment, chaos feels normal to you. Right. So if you begin to be in a relationship and it's chaotic, well, this feels fine. I can accept it because it's what I know. So our familiarity with negative experiences. Breeds comfort. Absolutely. And we stay where it's, where it's comfortable. We, people would rather stay in a relationship that's unhealthy because they know it. It's kind of like the devil you know. Right. Versus the fear of the unknown to branch out to do something different. And, and that's what keeps so many people stuck. And so I think that, you know, yeah, who'd, who'd, who'd she marry? And all these red flags, and she ignored them all. But what if she recognized, why did I? Why did I? 
Well, Instead of only pointing to him, yeah, it's, it's, it's a shit show there. I get it. Right. But you, she, needs to examine that to be able to, okay, you know what? I'm never going to do that again. Because she I seemed very logical. All. Never going to do that again. she said, I want to own the things that I did wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't. Right. And she, people can be in relationships that also bring out the worst in them. If, if we have unhealed trauma and we're with someone that's securely attached, it's going to be a better situation because that person is a balance to be able to hold up a mirror to behavior. But if we're in a relationship and we have unhealed trauma and we're with someone that also has unhealed trauma and also has things they haven't worked on, you know, that's just a, that's just a it's ticking a time bomb, form. you know? Right. And this relates so much to sex and intimacy too, because people... Good, now we get to the good part. I don't <laughs> want to seem too anxious, <laughs> because, but that's what you're you getting know, your PhD in. Yes, is. My, my PhD that I'm, I'm almost done with is in clinical sexology. And I did that because I wanted to be able to marry the focus I have on relationships with that intimacy work, because... You can't address an unhealthy relationship without addressing intimacy. And I'm not just talking about the physical act of sex. I'm talking about all of intimacy, that vulnerability and the ability to be free, the ability to have sensual and sexual embodiment, the, the ability to actually enjoy sex in a way that most people don't because most people are either performative or transactional or they're uncomfortable. Or they're shame attached. All those things, yeah. And so that prevents so many people from thriving in their relationship because they don't even understand that. You know, if their first sexual experience, their imprinted sexual experience was negative and poor, they might not know that it could be anything better. Right. You know, and so I think that's really important to understand that and to really look at what is my sex life like in addition to what is my relationships like and to understand, OK, when did I have a great sexual experience and why was it great? What was that about? You know, what did it how did it feel differently? And sometimes people are hardwired to say this is the only kind of sex I like. OK, well, why? Why is that the only kind of sex you like? When did you first have that kind of sex? I what had, does that mean to you? I had a friend that is a friend of yours too that ended up going to sex rehab. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and, and he'd been to rehab for cocaine and drinking mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, transfer, transference, I guess they call it, one yes. to the other. And um, I'm like, really? It's the first time I'd ever heard about a sex mm -hmm. rehab. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what do you do? They show you something <laughs> dirty and like beat you if you like it. I mean, <laughs> how do they get it out of you? And he said, it's not easy. He said the work that I had to do for chemicals, for mm -hmm. but what is it? He says that releases that chemical mm -hmm. inside me mm -hmm. that he, and I would never forget. He said, so the first time I did group, he said, you were supposed to talk about your partners. Mm -hmm. And he was like, uh, Tuesday scores or whatever mm -hmm. the yeah. girl in blue G string. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was seven o'clock, nine o'clock girl in red G string. And I was like, they didn't even have names. He goes, <laughs> they actually thought I was lying about it and making oh, it up. Yeah. But you know, all that tells me without knowing any other context is that that person was hurting and their outlet to numb the pain was to use sex as a balm to feel better. That's all that is. And so you can go to rehab for sex addiction. You can go to rehab for all these things. The same concepts are going to be there. We have to understand what it is that hurt us so much. And also, back to the being an asshole thing, hurt people hurt others. Right. And so sometimes it really is just about that person is hurting inside and they have no idea how to show up as a healthy human being. And this person that you're referencing they don't know how to have healthy sex. They don't know how to have sex that's satisfying emotionally. That's probably terrifying. It's probably completely not interesting to that person because it doesn't give a dopamine hit. But do they ever, can pain. they ever get over that? Absolutely. Because what a trap feeling Absolutely. that must, just must be like the darkest hole to go, am I ever going to have a normal relationship? Because we don't have to accept generational trauma or our own trauma we encounter as our inheritance in life. We don't have to accept that. We actually have the choice and the power to work on things on our own and, and create to our show own up differently. That's right. You know, if I don't know if he listens or not, I haven't had a relationship with my dad in years, mm -hmm. probably 12, 15 years. And one of the things I do remember him saying to me as a little girl is, you're responsible for your feelings. Other people don't make you feel something. Other people don't make you happy. Other mm -hmm. people don't make you sad. It's your interpretation of them in your surrounding and how you allow them to make you feel, mm -hmm. which is... You know. It's completely accurate. And unfortunately for him, he was somebody that when I was around, I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel those mm -hmm. things. And so eventually I, 
his lesson for me ended up working against him. And I mm-hmm. said, you know, I can't have you in my life anymore because mm-hmm. it only brings me pain. And that's so difficult to do. That's a difficult decision to make. But you were looking out for yourself and setting a boundary to protect yourself. And that's very admirable. And that's growth to be able to do that because it's hard. It's doing something that's against the grain of what's natural. And so you many know? people, I mean, at the time and place when I made that decision, you know, people, a lot of outside people have judgments. Well, you know, that's your fault. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. But I can because I'm just me. I was only born to be me, exist as me. Yes, mm-hmm. this is my parents, this is my mm-hmm. you know family, whatever. Right. But like you said, your boundaries. And one of the other things I want to touch on, because I do think it's so important, is what you said about your girls, is allowing space for them to be who they are, not who I saw them to be. That's right. I think that's one of the biggest things, just as an observer of people mm-hmm. very much like you, is oftentimes these young people are born and we cultivate so much enthusiasm for who we hope they become and what we see. And mm-hmm. even what we're taught as, as young women, like, you know, if you make a commitment in marriage, you have to honor that commitment. Don't get divorced or you need to show up and you need to look pretty. You need to have this aesthetic to be mm-hmm. pleasing to everybody else. Mm-hmm. But as we've evolved and we've developed all these different concepts of, of what is your attachment style or what is mm-hmm. your personality mm-hmm. style or who, what's your astrological sign we all have such individual energies that trying to place people in this box even our own children Mm -hmm. versus allowing them the space to evolve and develop like Sinclair is a perfect example for me with you is like she is so much her own identity and she's just trying to make this space for that it's wonderful and you know it's exhilarating to me but it's such an important lesson I think for for young parents is like really Mm-hmm. Hold space for who they are, what their creative interests are, and 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 we aren't put on this earth to to live out some parental fantasy That's somebody right. else had for us. I mean, what would it look like if we all got to just be who we authentically were, without the worry of acceptance? Right. If we could all actually embrace that, and that come, doesn't matter if you're in a relationship, it doesn't matter if we're talking about a relationship or with a parent figure or at work or in sex. If we could just be who we are without fear of, you know, acceptance, without fear of belonging, without fear of, um, you know, judgment or someone maybe not liking us or wanting to be with us. Do you think as Americans or the U.S. factor, we put more of a, of a bearance on that than let's say someplace like Europe? You know, I, I do believe that because I think that, I think unfortunately we have a lot of influences that are very negative. You know, I hate to to really say that because I try to be such a a person that tries to find the silver lining of we can all make it better. And I do think we can all make it better. But I think the influences we're going to naturally get are going to be negative. They just are. You know, we don't have that sense of, hey, do whatever you want to do as long as you're happy. There's more of no. No, this is your box. Here's your box. I feel that obviously COVID was horrible for the majority of our country. Mm -hmm. But it really, being at home... Mm-hmm. And forcing us to look at just I bet your practice went through the roof. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, anybody that was in a mental health space during that time, you know, actually was able to help so many people because people actually recognize I need this. This is isolating the isolation. We are not wired to be in isolation. You know, we literally match energy with people every day, all day long. And right. so if we're isolated, our, our mental health is going to suffer. And so, yeah, I think that, that people really looked at it differently. I think it changed. That was one of the great things about it is that it changed um, the silver lining, I'll say, for people, how they looked at mental health, that it's okay to get some help. Do you, where this would have been taboo 20 years ago, do you feel that people should be doing therapy prior to them getting married? 100 million percent. I created a course called To Do Before I Do. It's an online course. You don't have to go in to see anybody. You buy it on the internet. It's self-paced. You do it with your partner or by yourself. And it talks about those foundations. That if y'all aren't talking about these things, especially sex, like if you can't talk about sex, why are you having it? Period. And so it talks about money. It talks about attachment. It talks about communication. It talks about trust and transparency. You know, with the advent of tracking and people and what you should know and shouldn't know and privacy, there's just so many things that I think a lot of people don't understand what is healthy. They only know what they know that is familiar. Right. So if they bringing their, they're, they're bringing their past experiences from the last relationship into the new one and the other person's doing the same thing, what do you have there? Probably a disaster. But what if you took the time to spend a Friday evening, a Saturday day, a weekend of saying, you know what, we're going to start a life together. Why don't we buy a course? And if it's not my course, go get somebody else's course. But 
why don't we invest that time to figure out how we're going to work with each other in a healthy way and set some, basically a precedent of this is the way we're going to show up together. I think it would change so many things. And it's more than just date night. It's not date night. Do, does everybody need to have time together? Sure. But it's way more than that. But like constructive you know? time together. Like yes. But, but I, I think one of the biggest things where you learn a lot about somebody is how they are when they're angry. And I've told my daughters this since they were young enough to, to think about dating in that way. You want to see how someone is when they're angry. Because if their go-to is basically breaking all the power rules, you know, if they're going to put you down and they're going to become really emotionally dysregulated and they're going to then give you the silent treatment and they're going to criticize you, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? You know, it's funny you say that because one of my biggest takeaways my whole life is, yeah, forgive and forget is a great policy, but we don't forget. Mm -hmm. And forgiving is very hard. And so, like you say, what does somebody do when they're angry? It's been a very strong decision of mine that even if I feel anger, upset, to never say anything that somebody can't unhear. Well, it's very easy to actually learn the tool that says, you know what? I'm really upset right now. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go regulate myself. I'm going to calm down because I want to come back and then give you the respect that you deserve because I love you to have a conversation without hurting you. Because I'm curious about understanding what you feel. And maybe I won't agree with it. And maybe I won't know the answer. But I'm going to be present and listen. And I can't listen if I'm getting defensive and angry and lashing out. Because I love you enough to give you that. That's right. And I think it's one of the basic foundations that is so very missed. Instead, we're worried about, you know, uh, what somebody does for a living. Are we going to have a lot of fun together? What's our life going to look like? And, and you don't look at how are we actually going to interact relationally with each other. And that same thing goes over into sex again. People think, we don't need to talk about sex before. We had sex. It was good. Let's get married. Really? Okay, well, let's talk about how that's going to look in 20 years. Maybe you don't talk about it. What do you think this whole, like, Tinder, swipe left, swipe right, you know, finding somebody within three miles of your radius to hook up with, what do you think that's done for this sexual evolution or hindrance, even, of relationships? Well, my feelings on online dating, whether it's Tinder or any other app, is that, unfortunately, the world we live in, I think organic, meeting someone organically is difficult. It's just difficult. Um, People become very immersed in in their own lives, very focused, and I don't think that it's easy to meet somebody organically. I'm not saying impossible, and if someone does, beautiful, love it, great. But if you want to use apps, because it's easier, obviously, convenience, more access, great, more exposure to people. But I think you have to use that differently than the way most people use it. I think, number one, you have to be authentic. The idea of let's put out there the best version of ourselves, why? The moment someone's with you for a while, they're going to quickly figure out that it's not who you really are, right? right? Why so would they not want you? Be authentic, you know? Be authentic. And I'm not saying be negative, but just be honest about who you are. If you do not like to do outdoorsy shit, why on earth are you telling somebody you want to meet somebody go hiking? And it's not going to work out. And people do this all the time. I see it. People come in for sessions with me just to say, I can't, I can't get in a relationship. And I'll say, sometimes in my questioning, how, how do you meet people? Well, I'm on an app. Well, let me see your profile. And you're just like, wait. No, you know, and, and, and it's not being authentic and it's not talking about what's important, you know, and being able to say, these are the things that are important to me, your core drivers of who you are. And if you also can't answer that and you don't know who you are, then why are you even doing that? Why are you even on the app? Why aren't you instead investing a month to really figure out who you are? And so Putting the horse, I mean, the carriage that's in front right. of the horse. Yes. So I'm not against online dating at all. I just think it needs to be done in the right way. You know, otherwise you're just wasting everybody's time. And as far as it being used for hookups and for sex, sure, I think a lot of people enjoy transactional sex from it. And I'm not going to judge anybody's sex life. If transactional sex is what you want to do, that's great. But I think that you ought to know you want to do it and why you want to do it. Now, I think there's a time and a place for that. You may say, you know what? I want to have sex that's just because I want to feel good. And it's not about anything else, and that's what I want. And I'm honest and upfront and authentic with my partner to say, hey, this is all I want. Maybe somebody else wants that too, and then that's beautiful. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But... If you're having transactional sex and you're wanting something different and you're always disappointed, then why are you accepting less than you are deserve? I mean, so I think it's all about understanding what you want, who you are, and what you want out of a relationship, and then being authentic and vulnerable enough to, to put that out there. 